tonight, I have a special guest joining me all the way from Beijing, China, to discuss the challenges of trade between the U.S. and her home country. She's the host of a primetime English language television program overseen by the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. And though she and I may not agree on everything, I believe this is actually a really unique opportunity, an opportunity to hear a very different view. Now, as these trade negotiations stall out, it's helpful to know how the Chinese Communist Party is thinking about trade and about the United States. Now, in the interest of transparency, I should explain that I don't speak for anyone but myself as the host of a Fox Business show. My guest, however, is part of the CCP, and that's fine. As I said, I welcome different perspectives on this show. With all that in mind, I'm very pleased tonight to welcome Ms. Lu Xin, host of the Primetime Opinion Program, The Point with Lu Xin, to Trish Regan Primetime tonight. Now, just quickly to the viewers, please bear with us as we have a significant time delay in our satellites between Beijing and the U.S. And because of that, we're going to do our very best not to speak over each other. But, Shin, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you, Trish. Thank you, Trish, for having me. It's a great opportunity for me, unprecedented. I never dreamed that I would have this kind, kind of opportunity to speak to you and to speak to many audiences in ordinary households in the, in the United States. Um, yeah, it is uh, indeed you said unprecedented. A of things which, uh, uh, hang on. I need uh, to correct. I need to correct I'm because I'm going to ask you. Because I'm going to jump in. I guess our because satellites I am are not, kind of I am weird. Not, but tell me. Yeah, uh, forgive me. You are not what? Yeah. Uh, Trish, I have to get it straight. I am not a member of the Communist Party of China. Mm -hmm. This is on the record. So please don't mm -hmm. assume that I'm a member and I don't mm -hmm. speak for the Communist Party of China. And I'm here for network. today. I'm only speaking for myself okay. as Liu Xin, a journalist working for CGTN. So well, if anybody right. wants to quote me CGTN or anything, please put my name the CCP, there at least. But, okay. okay, appreciate it. Um, what's your current assessment? of where the trade talks actually are right now. Do you Sorry? believe, well, give me your current assessment of where we are on these trade talks. Do you believe a deal is possible? Um, it is true that the satellite connection is not very good, but I, I believe that you're asking me where we are in terms of the trade negotiations. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't have any insider information. What I knew was the talks were not very successful last time they were uh, going on in the United States, and now I think both sides are considering what to go next. But I think China has made its, the Chinese government has made its position very clear that uh, unless the United States treat the Chinese um, government, treat the Chinese negotiating team with respect, and uh, show the willingness to talk without using outside pressure, there is high possibility that there could be a productive trade deal. Otherwise, I think uh, we might be facing a prolonged period of, uh, of, of problems for both yeah. sides. But, and That's my I, I, would, I would stress that trade wars are never good. They're not good for, for anyone. Um, so I want to believe, Shin, I want to believe that something can get Agreed. done. And these are certainly challenging times. I realize there's a lot of rhetoric out there. Uh, but let me turn to one of the biggest issues, and that's intellectual property rights. I mean, fundamentally, I think we can all agree it's, it's never right to, to take something that's not yours. And yet, uh, in going through so many of these cases, cases at the Independent World Trade Organization, the WTO that China's a member of, as well as the, the DOJ and FBI cases, you can actually see some of them uh, on the screen right now. There's evidence there that China has stolen enormous amounts of intellectual property, hundreds of billions of dollars worth. Now, you know, that's a lot of money, but truly, I, I guess we shouldn't really care if it's hundreds of billions of dollars or just 50 cents. How do American businesses operate in China if they're at risk for having their property, their ideas, their hard work stolen? Well, I think, Trish, uh, you have to ask American businesses whether um, they wanted to come to China, whether they find coming to China and, and cooperating with Chinese businesses has not been uh, profitable or not, and they will, they will tell you their answers. As far as I understand, um, many American companies have been established in China, and they're very profitable, and the great 
the great majority of them, I, I believe, plan to continue to invest in China and, and explore the Chinese market. Well, now uh, U.S. President Donald Trump's tariff makes it a little bit more difficult, makes the, the, the future a little bit uncertain. I do not deny that there are um, IP infringement, there are uh, copyright issues, or there are piracy, or even theft of, of commercial, commercial secrets. I think that is um, something that has to be dealt with, and I think the Chinese government and the Chinese people, and me as an individual, uh, I think there's a consensus, uh, because without the protection of IP right, nobody, no country, no individual can, can be stronger, can develop itself. So uh, I think that is a very clear consensus among the Chinese uh, you know, society. And, and of course, there are cases where individuals, where companies go and steal. And I think that's uh, a common practice probably in every part of the world. And there are companies in the United States who sue each other all the time over infringement on, on IP rights. And you can't say simply because these cases are happening that America is stealing or China is stealing or the Chinese people are stealing. And basically that's the reason why I wrote that rebuttal because I think this kind of blanket statement is really not helpful, really not helpful. Well, it's not just a statement, it's, it's multiple reports including evidence from the WTO. But let me ask you about Huawei because that's certainly in the headlines right sure, now. Sure, I don't deny and, those. No, I don't and deny it, those. Right, I mean, you know, look, I, I think as I said, we can all agree that if you're going to do business with someone, it has to be based on trust. And you don't want anyone stealing your valuable information that you've spent decades working on. Anyway, no. China passed a law in 2017 requiring tech companies to work with the military and the government. So it's not just individual companies, right, that might be getting access to this technology. It's the government itself, which is an interesting nuance. But I get that China is upset that Huawei is not being welcomed into the U.S. markets. I totally get it. So let me just ask you this. It's an interesting way to think about it. I think, what if, what if we said, hey, you know, sure, Huawei, come on in. But here's the deal. You must share all those incredible technological advances that you've been working on. You've got to share it with us. Would that be okay? Uh, I think it is. If it is through cooperation, if it is through uh, mutual learning, if it is through, um, if you pay for the use of this IP of this high technology, I think it's absolutely fine. Why not? We all we all prosper because we learn from each other. I learned English because I had American teachers. I learned English because I had American friends. I still uh, learn how to do journalism because I have American uh, copy editors or editors. So I think that's fine so long as it is not um, illegal. I think everybody should do that and that's how you get better, yeah. right? But you mentioned something pretty important, which is that you should pay for the acquisition of that. And, you know, look, I, I think that the the liberalized economic uh, world in which we live uh, has has valued intellectual property and it, it's it's governed by a set of laws and so we all need to kind of play by the rules and, and play by those laws if we're going to have that kind of trust between each other but I, I think you bring up some good points let me turn to China right now which is now wow the second largest economy at what point Will China decide to abandon its developing nation status and well, stop borrowing from the World Bank? Well, I think this kind of discussion is going on, and I've heard uh, very live discussions about this. And indeed, there are people talking about China already becoming so big. Uh, why don't you just grow up? Basically, I think you said it in your program as well, China grow up. Well, I think we want to grow up. We don't want to be you know, dwarfed or, or poor or underdeveloped all the time. Um, but it, it depends on how you define developing country, right? If you look at China's overall size, the overall size of the Chinese economy, yes, we are very big, the world's number one. But don't forget, we have 1.4 billion people. That is uh, over three times the, the, the population of the United States. So if you divide the second largest overall uh, economy in the world, basically uh, when it comes to comes down to per capita GDP, we're 
I think less than one sixth of that of the United States, and even less than some uh, other more developed countries in Europe. So you tell me, uh, where shall we put ourselves? This is a very complicated issue because per capita, as I said, is very small, but overall it's very big. So we can do a lot of big things, and people are looking up, looking upon us to do much more around the world. So I think we are doing that. We're contributing to the United Nations. We are the world's biggest contributor to the UN. Human uh, UN peacekeeping missions, and we are we are giving out donations and human humanitarian aids and all of that because we know we have to grow up. And and Trish, thank you for that uh, reminder. <laughs> um, let's get to the tariffs. I, I've seen some of your commentaries too, and Shane, I appreciate that you think China could lower some of its tariffs. I, I watched you say that, and I'm totally in agreement with you. In 2016, the average tariff, effectively a tax, that was charged on an American good in China was 9.9 percent. Now, that was nearly three times what the U.S. was charging. So what do you say about this? What do you think about saying, hey, you know, to heck with these tariffs. Let's get rid of them altogether. Would that work? I think that would be a wonderful idea. Uh, I mean, don't you think for, for, for American Certainly consumers, do. products from China would be even cheaper? And for, for consumers in, in China, products from America would be so much, more, so much cheaper too. I think that would be a wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. I think we should work towards that. But you know, you talked about rule-based system, rule-based order. This is the thing. If you want to change the rules, it has to be done in mutual consensus. Basically, when you talk about tariffs, it is not just between China and the United States. I understand if you lower tariff between just between China and the United States, the Europeans will come, the Japanese will come, the, 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 the Venezuelans probably will come and say, hey, we want the same tariff. You can't discriminate you know, between, between countries. So it is a very complicated settlement to reach. And uh, um, I think the, the last deals, right? agreement that China and the, and, and the W about trade, yes, I'm talking about tariffs. And I think the last time when the world agreed on the kind of tariff reduction China should commit to was exactly the result of a multilateral and years of difficult negotiations. The United States saw in its interest and decided to what degree they can agree or to what degree they can lower their tariff. Nobody put a gun at their head. And China agreed to, although with some difficulties, to lower their, our tariff considerably. It is all the decision of countries according to their own self-interest. Now, things are different. Okay. Yes, I agree. 20 years later, what are we going to do? Maybe these old rules need to be changed. You know what? Let's talk about it. <laughs> let's, let's do it according to the rules. The same we rules. Should. If you don't like the rules, we'll mm -hmm. change the rules. But again, it has to well, be a multinational, a multilateral yeah, I, decision I, I process. I would just say, you know, you can go back to the Trade Agreement of 1974, Section 301. There is a rule that enables the United States to use tariffs to uh, try and influence the behavior of China should it be taking, stealing our intellectual property. And that, I think, in some ways is part of what this all comes back to, and it's this sense of trust. And it, it, I, I hear you on the forced technology transfer, and I think that some American companies perhaps have made some mistakes in terms of being willing to overlook what they might have to give up in the near term. Um, but this is an issue, I think, where uh, the country as a whole um, needs to step in, and we're seeing the United States do that, perhaps in a way that hasn't happened. I mean, it's been in the background. Don't get me wrong. I think previous administrations have identified the challenge, but have really been a, a little unwilling to take it on. So we're living in these very different times. Um, how do you define state capitalism? Uh, you mean how do I define? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the last. Thing. You mean sure, tra sure. forced technology transfer, no, no, no. Or so called I, 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 state forced capitalism. technology transfer? No, no. Well, I guess forced technology transfer capitalism. may be part of that, but state capitalism. In other words, because one of the things that with I, the I, I would technology just, transfer is somehow you kind okay. of skip it, skid it away. I, I, I'm playing well, a compliment here. <laughs> Hang on one second, Shin. I, I want to say that I think you know, your system of economics is very interesting because you know I, I you you have a capitalist system, right? But it's state run. So talk to us about that. How do you define it? Well, we, we would like to define a socialism with Chinese characteristics where the market, where market forces are expected to play 
the dominating or the deciding role in 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 the allocation of resources. Basically, you know, let uh, let the market. It's, we want it to be a market economy, but there are some Chinese characteristics. For instance, uh, some state-owned enterprises which are um, playing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, an important but increasingly smaller role, maybe in the in the in the economy. And uh, everybody thinks that China's economy is state-owned. Everything is state-controlled. Everything is state, state, state. But let me tell you, it is not the, the, the true picture. Uh, if you look at the statistics, for instance, 80% of Chinese employees were employed by private enterprises. 80%, 80% of Chinese exports were done by private companies, were produced by private companies. About 65% of uh, technological innovation were achieved, were carried out by private enterprises. The largest, uh, some of the largest companies that, that affect our life, for instance, some, some internet companies or some uh, 5G technology companies, they are private companies. So. Um, we we are yes a socialist economy with Chinese characteristics, but it's you know not everything state controlled, state run. It's not like that. We are actually quite mixed and very dynamic, dynamic and and actually very very open as well. Well, I, I think you need to probably keep being open. I think that that uh, you know as a free trade person myself, I, I I think that that's the direction to pursue, um, and ultimately that leads to greater economic prosperity for you and better economic prosperity for us and so then you get a win-win but um absolutely this was interesting i appreciate you being here thank you thank you thank you so much if you if you want to have a discussion in the future we can do that if you want to come to china i'd love it you're welcome and i'll take you around <laughs> thank you Trish, for the Shin, opportunity thank, thank you. you so much okay you know look i would just say uh, as as i told Shin. No one wants a trade war, but we have to think long and hard about the right next steps.